Hello everyone and welcome to the forest. This is Matt from In Defense of Plants and we're back after a little bit of a weather-induced hiatus. Many of you watching can probably empathize with the fact that we've had a bit of a delay with spring here. It's been miserably cold and we're getting a lot of snow. Now this isn't too unfamiliar for this region. Historically speaking, we would have had a lot later of a winter than what we've experienced in the last few years. But nonetheless, we're getting a little cabin fevery. So today it's nice out. There's plenty of things going on in the forest and we're going in search of one plant that is very near and dear to my heart, the white trout lily. Now where I'm from in New York, it's a rare species and it's declining because of invasive species, which we'll touch on in a little bit. But here in Illinois, where I live now, it's everywhere. In fact, I'm not even gonna lie to you, we're gonna find it today. And it's a really special little plant. And along the way, we're gonna see all of its fun little friends. So come on, let's go look for it. Spring is hands down my favorite time to be in the forest. After so many months of just dreary gray nothingness, life just seems to come exploding back with vigor. And the star of the show, for me at least, are these woodland herbs. Now we think of spring ephemerals as shade lovers because eventually this will become a forest understory. But if you look above me, there's not a leaf in sight. So really, these plants are taking advantage of a lot more sun than what the summer crew is going to get living down here. The other aspect I love is the fact that spring ephemerals strike this balance between being super hardy and also extremely delicate. There's a fine balance to living this lifestyle and they do it in such superb ways. And again, after all of that dreary nothingness, what is not to love about all of these wonderful blossoms? One of the other things I really admire about spring ephemerals is just their longevity. These plants keep coming back decades after decades and under the right conditions can live probably close to a century or more. They also grow really slow as a result. It's not a fast race like you would get with desert annuals. These woodland herbs can take their time and they do so. These baby trillium here are probably only about three if not five years old and they only have a single leaf. It's slow and steady wins the race but it also makes them extremely sensitive to things like disturbance, especially when it comes to logging, plowing of fields, anything like that. So you just have to sit back and admire some of the plants you're seeing are truly ancient. And here is what we came looking for. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the white trout lily. It's one of my favorites because like I said, where I come from in New York, it's extremely rare to find and it's on the decline thanks to invasive species, but out here, it's extremely common. Now, if you look at these leaves, you'll notice we've probably been seeing them throughout this entire video, but it's this speckling that gives them the common name trout lily because I guess trout are speckled. There's another common name for these too, the dog tooth violets, and they're not violets. And the dog tooth might seem strange until you see what their corms look like underground. It looks like the tooth of a canine. But besides all of that, these are just a charming woodland herb, really worth getting to know. They have these downward pointing flowers, which gives us this air of modesty, these beautiful white petals that can actually range quite a bit in color. In fact, from up above looking down onto it, I see hues of blue and even some grays. It's really nice if you get down and up close with it. Now, the last few days have been really cold. In fact, we've gotten snow. And these have only been in bloom for a couple of those days, which tells you just how hardy this species can really be. And as you can imagine, insects are really hard to come by this time of year. It's kind of luck whether or not there's enough out to pollinate these flowers. And it does have a backup plan. These plants reproduce largely vegetatively. So when you go out into the woods and you see a whole colony of trout lily leaves, it's likely that they're either clones or very closely related. In the event that they do get pollinated, this stem here that bears the flower and the ovaries will eventually bend down to the ground and that's where the seeds will ripen. That way when the pod opens up, they can attract their seed dispersers, which are actually ants. Now, I wish we could show you this right now, but it's not that time yet. The seeds of this plant look like tiny black BBs with little fatty capsules attached to them. And it's those fatty capsules that attract ants that ants want to take back to their nest. They feed on the fat and then throw away the seed into a nutrient rich midden where the plant can then germinate and grow. Now, seeing a lot of these is a really good indication that the forest has not been disturbed in a while. They do not survive plowing or a lot of trampling. So 
celebrate it when you do find a large colony. Now they may be common here today, but commonness and rarity are just snapshots in time. And there's one plant in particular that I can see from the corner of my eye over here that is threatening the survival of woodland herbs like this. And let's go look at it so I can explain a little bit more about why it's doing the damage that it's doing. Now this little menace right here is an invasive species called garlic mustard, and it definitely is invasive in North America. It's a mustard that was introduced from Europe as a food plant, but here, where it has not evolved as part of the ecology, it runs amok. Now like most mustards, it does not form mycorrhizal relationships with any soil fungi. So it just relies on its own roots to get the nutrients it needs. Now other plants aren't so lucky, and here, in North America, where again, it's not part of the ecology, it releases compounds that actually kill off mycorrhizal fungi, putting the plants around it at a disadvantage. As such, it can increase its populations to an insane degree and really crowd out spring ephemerals and other woodland herbs in the process. In fact, some research shows that it even harms trees. Now, if you aren't going to damage too much in the process, it's probably a good idea to try and remove this as much as possible, especially on your own property. And to do so, you just grab it at the base and pull just enough and unlike me hope you get as much of the root as possible because if you leave too much of it behind it can actually grow a whole new plant and continue the noxious cycle it's everywhere we're probably not going to eliminate it but it's all about management and i've seen a lot of success especially on smaller properties so do your part and remove invasive species like this you'll be really happy you did